All right. Um, well, I know people are trickling in, but um, we'll just get started as more people are joining. Um, my name is Andrew Yunke, and I'm here with my colleagues, Parneet Guman and Jacob Rosales, and we work for the California Health Interview Survey, also known as CHIS, um, which we will be saying a lot probably in this session. Um, the director of our center um, and the principal investigator for CHIS, Nanez Ponce, um, spoke earlier this morning at the conference. Um, so we're here to answer any further questions that people may have from anything that she talked about um, or any other questions related to using data, um, what CHIS data resources are available, um, and anything else that may come up as we go through. Um, we prepared a few um, slides just to kind of talk about CHIS briefly and the, specifically the data products um, and offerings of CHIS. Um, but we can kind of just go from there as questions come up. Um, we'll keep it pretty relaxed and um, if you have a question, um, pop it in the chat and then we can sort of go off on tangents as needed. Um, so I think that said, um, we can go to the next slide and just start with a brief introduction of what the California Health Interview Survey is. Um, so the California Health Interview Survey is the largest state health survey in the nation. Um, and I think um, Dr. Ponce talked about this earlier. Um, it's conducted annually um, and it's a web and telephone survey, mainly web now. Um, and we have a wide range of questions from pretty much all health topics, but also health insurance, demographic questions, um, questions about um, immigrant health, questions about um, racial ethnic disparities, um, chronic diseases, mental health, um, pretty much the whole gamut of anything that sort of is health or health um, related. And the data that we collect um, is from the state of California, representative um, of all 58 counties. Um, we have around between 20 and 25,000 adults that are surveyed every year. And then um, we get around three to 4,000 children and one to 2,000 teens, um, which we define as ages 12 through 17 um, every year. And the sampling is done um, address-based sample, a random address-based sample. So we really do um, put forth a lot of methodology um, to try to make our sample as representative of the population of California as possible so that the data can be used um, for a wide range of um, research and other um, policy, policy impacts for the entire state. Next slide. Yeah, so as I mentioned, um, we really do try to um, get a diverse data set that is representative of California. Um, we are relatively known for having, I think Dr. Ponce talked about this earlier, for having um, more of that hard to find data on racial and ethnic subgroups, as well as sexual minorities, immigrants, um, many other populations that often data is not necessarily readily available or collected for. Um, and that's really important part of our work and really like a main goal of our mission is to be able to do research on these populations that are otherwise like not as represented in other data sources. Um, and when we get to the next slide, we'll talk about um, some of the data uh, products and offerings that CHIS has and how some of those can be used to um, do that analysis at maybe um, subgroup levels for racial or, or ethnic groups. Um, and as part of that, um, on the last bullet here, we do conduct CHIS in multiple languages. Um, and the ones listed there are the ones that we currently have. Um, and so we really do try to make it so that it's accessible to all people who may be responding within the state. Next slide. Here now. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned, um, here's a list of our CHIS uh, data products. So I think these, these are kind of interesting items. Um, for people who may be in this session or people who are attending this conference listening to Dr. Ponce earlier, is how can you use CHIS data? How can you access it and use it for your own research? Um, so we have a few options. Um, I'll briefly talk about the first two and then turn over to Jacob and Parneet to maybe talk about the others. Um, so we do have a public use file 
Um, we actually have two public use files. Um, one is posted on our website, which is the single year public use file. So we release this annually um, after every year's data collection. So we, um, at the end of last year, we released the 2019 single year PUF file. And now we're working on preparing the 2020 PUF file as we speak, which will come out um, later this year. Um, and then we also have some other um, ways to access our more confidential data, um, which maybe Parneet, you can talk about for a moment. Um, DAC projects to researchers who are interested in analyzing our confidential data. Um, so as Andrew mentioned, we have public use files that contain um, uh, publicly accessible data, but um, confidential data do include um, variables that um, are deemed to be highly sensitive and or identifiable. Um, so this, um, app, so, so accessing um, a DAC project would involve completing um, an extensive application through us. And so um, once that application is approved, then um, researchers are welcome to submit data requests um, to our um, statistical unit. And our statistical unit will, um, uh, will analyze those data for researchers and send back output. Um, so it's a very popular option for people who are wanting to, um, to really get in depth with exploring our data. And um, yeah, if there are any further questions about that, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. So please let me know. Yeah, and one cool yeah, thing one about, cool thing about, about our data uh, um, access center projects is that as Parneet said, you can get more into like the nitty gritty of um, these variables that are super important to CHIS, such as these racial ethnic subgroups, um, more sensitive immigrant um, health information, um, some of our sexual health questions and things like that, that um, are not deemed to be, um, you know, like general enough for us to include in our public use file, but that are important, as we mentioned before, to kind of getting at these populations that are, nece that are sometimes um, not necessarily represented in, in data that's collected. And then Jacob, do you wanna um, just talk about our, um, our online query tool platforms, Ask Chiz and Ask Chiz Neighborhood? Yes, um, I'm going to share my screen, though, because I think it's going to be easier to actually kind of show where you can access these and give you ideas of the different products that we offer. So give me one moment. Uh, I'm, gl I'm glad to see that my cat filter isn't on. I saw that uh, yesterday, the cat. I'm not sure if people saw the cat video, but I'm glad my cat video, my cat filter is off. So that's good. You can see me in all my majesty. OK, so um, right now I've got it set to the uh, main, uh, our UCLA Center for Health Policy Research um, page. Um, it's healthpolicy.ucla.edu. If you can't remember that, just go to Google and type CHPR or UCLA CHPR. It should be the first hit that you get to. Um, before I really talk about our Ask Chiz and Ask Chiz Neighborhood Edition, though, I really want to talk about these different COVID-19 dashboards that we have because COVID-19 is such a hot button issue right now. So to get to our COVID-19 dashboards, all you have to do is go here to the health profiles. We have COVID-19 dashboards. So the first one I'm going to introduce you to is our 2020 uh, CHIS, um, CHIS preliminary COVID-19 estimates. So when we got the orders to stay at home um, because of COVID-19, we started to group up as a team and say, you know, 2020 CHIS is currently in the field we really want to know if we, we should start we should start getting COVID-19 data. So we made it, we added some extra COVID-19 questions. And uh, from that, we started to release pre preliminary estimates from the COVID-19 specific questions around, I believe it was May or June was the first month that we did. So we have May, June, July, August, uh, preliminary estimates from 2020 um, around May or June of this coming year when we start getting the 2021 survey going on we'll start we'll continue that with that with 2021. So we have a, a myriad of different uh, COVID-19 questions treatment if respondents thought they ever had COVID-19 if they went to a physician um, if they were tested if they received a positive test um, their uh, views with regards to uh, taking the vaccine. 
Um, we also asked other things like personal impacts, like if they were essential workers, how it impacted them in the workplace, how it impacted them at home with regards to kind of conflict and whatnot. Um, we also we also started asking some um, Asian and Pacific Islander specific COVID-19 questions. I know Nines had mentioned that in her um, in her session, um, and we were asking questions about um, exposure to hate crimes, um, if they felt that um, they if they felt th if they felt uh, Asians were the cause of of COVID-19, um, other things with regards to employment and whatnot. So this is, you know, this is a really good tool here, our preliminary COVID estimates. I highly recommend you go through it. We also have some sub-state estimates at different counties and county groupings in the state of California. Um, you have to excuse my computer. It runs pretty slow when I have the zoom on and I share the screen. So right now, yeah, we're getting a spinning wheel of death. But um, I highly recommend hitting up these COVID-19 dashboards that we have. Um, we also have here, which is what we call our COVID-19 rates and risk factor dashboard. We update every week. We gather data from um, LA Times. They have a pretty comprehensive list that they get from the this, uh, California Department of Public Health, as well as other county public health departments on the number of the cases of COVID-19 and the rates of COVID-19. Alongside this, we also gather race and ethnicity data from the different counties in California that provide that information to put together uh, case and death rates by race and ethnicity. And then finally, Inez had mentioned this as well, we have uh, the, the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander COVID-19 Data Policy Lab. We have this dashboard as well, and this, this gathers data from the COVID-19 race tracker um, website, and we have different um, Different views on here, especially give you kind of like a time, um, a time series view of COVID-19 rates by race and ethnicity. So these are kind of our COVID-19 dashboards and are really important. Um, and now I'm gonna go over to talking about our Ask Chiz and our Ask Chiz Neighborhood Edition. First I'll talk about Ask Chiz. Um, every year we, we update Ask Chiz with new estimates, new data, um, and allows users to go in so say maybe you don't know how to use a SAS or an SPSS, or you don't want to use that and then run, run, a, run, a, run a query through that. You can go on this online platform. You can do it by different counties. In Los Angeles counties, we have the service planning areas. And in San Diego County, we have the different health regions. So you can get, you can get direct estimates from CHIS data. You can pull that together if you want more power. Um, and it's a myriad of topics, anything from from health conditions, chronic conditions, diabetes, um, race, ethnicity, a bunch of a bunch of demographics. This is a real useful tool to use. Um, one uh, one thing is is that it only covers. It really doesn't. It, it's limited with regards to sub county geographies. Um, you know, you can get a little bit of sub county at Los Angeles and San Diego County, but that's about it. So what we did in around, I believe it was 2014, 2015 we initiated the Ask Chiz Neighborhood Edition platform. Now, the data coming from this, this is all modeled estimates. These are not direct estimates from the Chiz survey. These are modeled estimates. Um, with doing these small area modeled estimates, though, we're able to provide data uh, estimates at the census tract level, the zip code level, um, legislative districts, so you're talking congressional districts, the state senate districts, the state assembly districts, huh. counties, and cities. We have, we just today launched uh, the 2018 data. So that's in here, we have, we have data updated for 2018, as well as we have these four different vulnerability indices that Nines had mentioned previously. We have the area, area deprivation index, healthy places index, pre-existing health vulnerability index, and the social vulnerability huh. index. One thing to, to note, please, is that all these indices are only available at the census tract level. We don't have them at the other geographies. Um, I would kind of give you a, a brief a tour, but my, I know my computer is going to run super slow because it's just how it is. But um, you can go here, askchisney.ucla.edu, or if you're on the center's homepage, you just select this Ask Chiz here.
and you have two options. You you go go to Ask Chiz or go to Ask Chiz Any. If you don't have us, if you don't have, you have to have a login. It's a real simple procedure. Just type in your email, your name, and then create a password, and then you're, you're able to go in there and access this and get this information. That's kind of the, the brief run through. I know we got about like 12 minutes left, so I don't know if any any questions. So I, I just so you know, I've been dropping those links of the things you've been doing in the chat, so people, it's clickable for people in the Whova chat. And there is a question in the Q&A. Andrew, did you see that? Yeah, yeah, I was just looking at that question. So we can um, start with this question. And then if there are other questions related to what Jacob Aparni talked about, we can go to there. So we have a question in the chat. Can everyone, is everyone um, able to see the questions in the chat, Rachel? Or is it just for, are we? Oh, there, the, in the Whova chat, everyone can see it. Or in the Q&A, I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah, everyone can see it. OK. So for the question, the Q and A, this question in the Q and A about um, why we don't have a response option for non-binary for our gender identity questions. So, so um, I think there are two two answers to this, um, uh, and I don't think any of us on this panel right now are part of the team that specifically looks at these type of questions. Um, but we do have technical advisory committees that meet every year to go over different topic areas of our survey. Um, and so one of those um, technical advisory committees made up of people from different organizations outside of um, CHIS, outside of the Center for Health Policy Research from all over the state, um, and people who are considered to be experts in the field um, come together and meet in these technical advisory committees and go over our questions talk about which questions should be added, talk about the wording of the questions, the wording of the answers, and really refine all of that. So we do have a technical advisory committee that looks at um, specifically gender identity um, and uh, those sort of related topics. Um, so that committee and their report on that would provide the, the full answer to your question. Um, so we can look into that um, or look to see what that um, report showed from that committee and try to get a more specific answer for you. But I think just to kind of explain how the questionnaire works um, based off of the follow-up that you posted, um, we ask about the original birth certificate assignment. Um, and the, the, there are only two options, male or female in our, in our survey. And again, that has to do with the decisions by that technical advisory committee. Um, but then the follow-up question about how you currently describe yourself allows you to um, input um, your current gender identity as a written in response. So what we call an other specify response. So we provide some categories, but then because um, we can't necessarily provide every category, we allow people to write in their, um, their own response and the follow-up question. Um, so that allows for us to capture um, things that may not be listed in the specific answer choices provided. Um, so I, hopefully that answers your question a little bit. As for the, the follow-up that you put, um, that next question is just confirming what the answers before were. So if you wrote in a response to what your gender identity was in the, in the write-in spot, then it would include that write-in answer in the following question. Um, I'm not sure I understand the follow-up question just posted. Maybe Antonio can unmute themselves so that um, mm -hmm. they can, you can have a conversation as a possibility. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, it seems analogous to the argument treating it different than male and female, um, similar to the argument of separate but equal that was used to justify kind of racial discrimination. Um, if it's on my birth certificate and on my driver's license in the same way that male and female are, I'm just kind of confused as to why that hasn't been taken into consideration. And then if you've accounted for that and the accuracy of your data, because it has been a legally recognized gender marker in the state of California for three and a half years. So my birth certificate and driver's license can have that. But if I were to take your questionnaire, it wouldn't account for me or my population. So <clears throat> I'm kind of curious as to, because at the beginning of the presentation, it was stated that you are well known for minority data, which is hard to obtain. 
And I completely agree with you. It's hard to attain uh, across all state agencies, especially. So um, I'm just kind of curious as to the process. And it sounds like there's just a committee, but who's appointed to this committee? What representation is on this committee? Because again, it, it should be treated the same as male and female. Yeah, totally. Thank you for for um, elaborating on that and explaining. Um, again, we can we can find kind of the um, the decisions made by that committee and and maybe send those out for this. Um, I don't have those reports right in front of me, and I don't think any of the three of us um, here were are on that technical advisory committee. Um, but I, I do understand your question. Um, I'm, I can't say exactly why the decision is made to only include the male and female options for the birth certificate, but that's good feedback that we can definitely provide to those who um, are a part of that um, decision-making process. Um, and as for your question about who is on that committee, it is, it, those committees are pulled from people throughout the state who work closely on these issues. Um, I know we have people from UCLA as well as um, state health organizations and other um, organizations, nonprofits, community groups, things like that, who are a part of those. So again, we can look to see, I can look to see um, who exactly is a part of that and get some organizational information to you about that. I just will need to find that report so we can um, try to follow up with that information after this. And Andrew, this is Carrie with CPEN. I don't know if you can hear me, but CPEN is also um, on uh, one of the Ch the CHIS technical advisory committees. And um, just a plug that it's a really great um, way to weigh in on uh, the you know these types of questions. Why why you know CHIS asks questions one way or another. Um, it is a, a really pretty open process, and I know you know they're often um, you know, looking looking for folks in in these in different areas um, to help advise them on on the most you know up to date way to ask these questions. So, um, yeah, I really I really hope that you'll um, you know uh, look into this and um, and see you know see see if it makes sense to part for you to participate. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that for that follow up, and I just want to echo that that. This is sort of something that we revisit every year and we have the group and I think getting these um, getting these new voices in there is, is very important. So we will definitely follow up with you, um, Antonio, about, about this um, once we're able to get the full information. Are there any other questions? We have about five minutes left. Um, I just wanted to mention something that I think I glossed over a little bit earlier, um, but we have um, two separate public use files. So we have a lot of um, folks who are interested in um, specifically, um, we get a lot of requests for um, Asian subgroup uh, analyses or research. Um, and that's a big thing that a lot of researchers at the center look at. And so I just wanted to, to point out that um, in addition to our single year public use files that are posted on our website, we have a short application um, form where you can apply for a two year public use file, which just combines two years of CHIS data into one. So for example, our most recent one was the 2017-2018 two year public use file. Um, and what that does is it allows us to include more variables and more data that we wouldn't otherwise have been able to include um, in the smaller sample one year public use file. Um, and as part of that, we do include our variables on um, Asian subgroups. So if you're if you're interested in doing research on that, but um, don't necessarily have the means, um, either the funds or the, the time to go through our data access center projects, um, the two year public use file is a, is a simple way to be able to get some more um, racial ethnic data um, to be able to do research on your own with. So I just wanted to plug that. Um, a qu question for you, Andrew, H how do you, um, how do you guys, you know, choose the questions that you focus on every year? Um, you know, is funding a part of that and you know, what, um, 
what, how can we as advocates, you know, um, like if we're interested in a new issue area or, you know, we want to find out more, how can we um, collaborate with you on that? Yeah, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, that's a great question. Um, so yes, a lot of it is um, funding driven. So we have a, a core set of questions that we um, strive to include on every year's survey. And those questions are funded by our um, kind of main permanent funders. And then on top of those core questions, every year the, um, the questions and the sections are determined by um, both feedback from, from different groups and organizations on important topics, things that we, based off of our expertise, know are important topics that we need to include, and then um, which organizations or groups um, work with us to provide funding for certain questions. So we've had a lot of examples in the past from like local health department, local county health departments um, to um, health groups such as Kaiser, um, other nonprofit groups, um, other groups who are looking to do just research on public health, um, who have worked with us to fund specific questions that they're interested in, in gathering data about. Um, for example, uh, in 2018, we had um, some researchers at UCSF who funded a set of questions um, about marijuana and then about sleep and technology. So they worked with us. Um, we, um, we have a great team that can work with you to kind of like map out how much funding is needed for a certain number of questions, how the whole process works, what you'll get um, access to as, um, as part of being a funder and how we then get the data to you to use. Um, so if you're interested in something like that or interested in, in collaborating on, on questions um, for future surveys, um, you can reach out to us, I think, I put in the last slide, I don't know if we can go back to the slides or not, um, but I put I can put them in the chat, the email addresses that you can reach out to. Um, so on the last slide, yes. Oh, that's, that's not very good font. So we have two um, that you can reach out to and either one, I'll put it in the chat as well. Um, Either one of those, just reach out, let us know like what organization you're with, what your interests are, and we'll connect you to our director and our questionnaire team who will then, who can then um, connect with you and, and kind of chat about what your interests are and what the possibilities might be. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, well, it's one o'clock. Um, so unless there are any, any other last second questions, I think that that um, about takes up our time. So Rachel, I don't know if there's anything else that you would like to add as well. Yeah, I wanna thank all three of you for sharing your knowledge and, um, and the work that you do at CHIS. And um, just to remind people that at in Whova, there's a, rate session button and uh, I encourage you to do it to give us feedback so we know how to make things better for next time. This is our first time doing office hours so we're definitely learning. So please feel free to um, add, put your feedback in there and we hope to see you all at tomorrow's uh, day three of the conference. Thanks everybody and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks so much everyone. Thanks Rachel. Thank you.